Welcome to ReChurch. I'm Marshall Fant, the Director of Church Consulting and Strategic Planning for Gospel Fellowship Association Missions. My purpose is to encourage pastors and church leaders as you refocus, renew, and revitalize your churches. We've established this podcast to offer practical tips and suggestions as you equip disciples to make disciples. It's Marshall Fant. Welcome back to another episode of Preparing to Preach, the current GFA podcast series. Appreciate GFA uh, sponsoring the podcast so much and allowing us to do this series that hopefully will uh, prepare and equip pastors, Sunday school teachers, as they prepare a certain book of the Bible. So if you've been uh, watching or listening to this series, we've been tackling uh, from a pastor's perspective. So we're having pastors, as they have preached and labored in a particular book, to come on and share. Basically, uh, I'm asking the same questions for each book of the Bible so you kind of know what's coming. But at the same time, I give them the liberty to if they need to segue off on something uh, that we could. So again, for our listeners and viewers, our guest today is probably no stranger to you. So Pastor Gary Reemers, welcome back to ReChurch. Thank you. Glad to join you, Marsh. Yeah, so good. Pastor Reemers, of course, has taught for many years on the seminary level, also pastors Cornerstone Baptist Church in uh, here in Greenville area, but you also pastored New England before that. So he's got many years. He and his wife, Jan, are just a wonderful uh, team, as I like to think of pastors and their wiser team. So they, so um, again, thank you, Pastor Reemers and Jan, for all y'all do and have done to minister so many. So today's topic, the book of Daniel. So preparing to preach the book of Daniel with Pastor Gary Reemers. So uh, just some background information, Pastor Reemers, as we go through this. So as you considered the book of Daniel, which is daunting in itself, okay, for many people, um, did you do anything differently? We're talking a book of prophecy mainly. Did you do anything differently in your preparation long before you really got into your studies? Um, is there anything you did differently as you decided to select this book? No, not really. That I, I follow a pattern of sermon preparation that I have found uh, adapts very naturally to virtually any genre okay. at all throughout yeah. Scripture. Yeah. So there was nothing different. Here. So what is that pattern? Uh, it is uh, passage by passage, mm-hmm. and it is searching for a message in that passage. Uh, I, okay. I, 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 uh, Right, based on Second uh, Timothy three sixteen and seventeen, uh, I became convinced years ago that every passage is written specifically mm-hmm. to correct something wrong in the lives of God's people. Mm-hmm. It's what Brian Chapel calls the fallen condition focus. Right, and then the answer to that 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 actually essentially uh, describes the problem. That single statement. And then I look at the entire passage I'm going to preach, and I'm looking for the for the for God's answer to that mm. particular problem. And I state that in a single sentence as mm. well, okay, including both truth from right. that passage okay. and what God expects us to do about it. So I look for the same things, no matter what passage of Scripture I'm in. Good. All right. So as you uh, approach the Book of Daniel, did you preach this Sunday morning, Sunday night? Wednesday night, what was your... This was a Sunday night, Okay, and it does go back into my archives. This was <laughs> 20 years ago now. Okay, uh, I'm, I've actually, the last few years, been thinking about going back and, and doing this again. Mm. Uh, I, I'm fascinated by the book, and uh, I, I, I hope to do that sometime soon. All right, so Sunday night, and um, about how many messages did you preach on that? Oh, um, I can tell you exactly. Okay, I, I, I made the decision, uh, and this was challenging. That this was one of the hardest things about preaching through Daniel is that I, looking, reading through it, I it just seems that every chapter is a single story, mm, okay, and a single message. The challenge is some of these chapters are really long, yeah. and can be pretty detailed. But that's I, I decided that's the way I was going to do it. 
And so I've got 12 messages Mm -hmm. on the book of Daniel. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm not exactly sure I would do it that way again, but I think so. I I think it worked really well. You do have to move along through every chapter. Right. But uh, but I thought I felt like it worked. So as you did that and as you prepared, it's and again, like I, I love to hear you say what you said. If you did it next time, may do it a little bit differently, but integrate the way the Spirit of God, you know, clearly directs a pastor as he labors in the word of how to divide it and bring it up. So um, that's good. Okay. Yeah. Uh, now, on the personal side, again, I know um, you, you've worn several hats. You're a seminary professor as well as a pastor, you teach preaching. Um, you've, you've taught so much in this area, but if you were recommending for a man to let's say he has not tackled the book of Daniel before as a pastor, would you recommend again, all this is still introductory. Is there anything you would recommend him to do to prepare him, uh, to get to the point, to be ready to dive into Daniel? Well, Daniel, like any book of the Bible, I think the key preparation is reading through the entire book, uh, preferably in one sitting, and uh, preferably do that numerous times. But to try to just get a big picture view of the whole thing, uh, to me, that's uh, that. And that actually comes from G. Campbell Morgan. Read it through. Read it through. And, and, you know, I think uh, Pastor Reimers, the others we have interviewed for this have said the exact same thing. Okay, Mm -hmm. preparation is one time, read it through as many times as you can, next day or whenever, but in its, you know, in its totality at one time. So, again, and all the men, so I would echo anyone preparing to preach the book exactly what Pastor Reimers just said to get that to get that big picture. In fact, I think, didn't G. Campbell Morgan do the Analyzed Bible, which gives you kind of the big picture of each yes. of each book yeah, of the Bible? I've, and that's very helpful. It I is. have that. Yeah, I think we all do. Okay. <laughs> all right. So let's get into, uh, you know, really, the, the as, you, as you preach this, uh, as far as the congregation, uh, did you do anything to prepare for this series before you present the first sermon? Uh, to the congregation? Did you give them any, was there something, did you preach anything leading up to this or you launched mm-hmm. into Daniel and away you went? I, I don't think there was any uh, effort to prepare the congregation for it. I, I do announce it ahead of time when I'm starting a new series right. and would and would encourage them to read through the book sure. as well. And then, of course, going through a book, they always know what passage is coming up next week, and right. I encourage them to read that through as well. But uh, I, I think that's the best preparation for the people. All right. So as we uh, now we're going deep dive into Daniel. All right. So the twelve chapters. What what did you find is that key theological verse or passage in the book that, as some say, mm-hmm. that the book hinged on? Now, I know. Daniel may be a little bit different approaching it that way, but did you find a passage or verse that kind of hinged, that made everything hinge? Yes, yes. I, I became convinced that the emphasis of the very first chapter mm. continues to show up in every chapter of the book, and hence that really is the key to the book as a whole. And there is one passage that okay. seems to say it particularly well, for Daniel, uh, I think it's Daniel 4, at the end of Nebuchadnezzar's experience of losing his mind uh, by, uh, uh, under God's uh, direction, seven years later, his mind comes back to him, and he draws a conclusion. Uh, he says, at the end of days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted my eyes to heaven. My reason returned to me. And I blessed the Most High and praised him. And here's what he said. For his dominion is for is an everlasting dominion. His kingdom endures from generation to generation. Mm. All the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing. And he does according to his will. There it is. Among the hosts of heaven, among the inhabitants of the earth, and none can stay his hand or say to him, what have you done? Wow. What a statement of the sovereignty of God. Exactly. And so, Daniel 4, 34 and 35. Yeah. 
Yeah, right from the very beginning of the book. And then that just, and I think it's amazing that God uses the voice of a pagan king yeah. to solicit that conclusion. Wow. So no now, excuse for anybody. Um, did you, in, in your study, did you know this was the coming, uh, this was the passage that things would hinge on, or did you, or the, the key, or did you find that during your study? I, I was uh, very aware of those two verses okay. because they factor in large in my, um, in my study of the sovereign will of God. But okay. I, I think what one thing that surprised me is how that guides the entire book. That that really succinctly says the theme of the book. Interesting. Um, now, as you did this, all right. So as you work through again twelve chapters in twelve weeks on a Sunday night, um, I guess the the question I would have: so what? Which of these passages to you, as you labored, presented the greatest theological challenge? <laughs> that that would be chapter ten. Okay. Chapter 10 is <laughs> describing the, um, the predicament of waiting for the angel to finally get there to announce to Daniel the answer to his question. The whole chapter is about uh, the delay and the battle that the angel had with the prince of Persia and so forth. And then he finally gets to Daniel. And But nothing in the chapter has the message he's going to deliver. That's chapter 11. So it's all about this uh, challenge that an angel was facing who wanted to come and, and minister to Daniel. Um, wow. What's, uh, I mean, I have to tell you, I puzzled over that one. What's the message here? How, how does this affect us? But there is a message here. I, yeah. I was able to conclude, and it does affect us. There's application there too, but well, I'm I'm uh, willing to admit that was a challenging chapter. So uh, the what would you say is how did the congregation? Um, I don't. I, I'm gonna put it this way. I have found in some of those challenging passages, it clarifies in our hearts exactly how to preach that passage. So um, was there any, um, the congregation seemed to grasp it okay, or is that hard to say, or is that too subjective a question? It's hard to imagine, hard to remember since it was 20, 20 years, years ago. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. But uh, yes, I, I'm confident they got the message because I, e even in my phraseology of main points and even sub points, there is built in application. There, uh, I strive to express truth in universal truths right. yeah. Yeah. and uh, exhortations, of course, directly to our people today. So I'm sure they got it. It was me getting it. That was the challenge. Uh, All right. So, and you just mentioned application. So, as we walk through this, uh, were there other situations that presented, or certain passages that presented, a application challenge? as you went through Daniel or were there certain application themes that kept just coming up or how, what did you find in your labor through Daniel? Application is a particular challenge in old Testament narrative. Mm -hmm. And although Daniel is a, a prophet and the book of Daniel has lots of prophecy in it, yet the first six chapters and even uh, much of the last six chapters it's historical narrative or yeah. prophetic narrative. Mm -hmm. And it's it, one of the characteristics of narrative literature is that they tend not to have explicit exhortations in them, right. like, yeah. like an epistle would. Mm -hmm. So you're left with a, a challenge as a preacher. And I think as people are uh, just reading God's word, we, we share this as well, that if, there, if what you're reading is truth, then the question is, based on that truth, what would God? Ex how would God expect me to respond? Mm. And it's the answer to that question that you then would incorporate into the message in the form of application to our people today. 
Were and, there, and there's always an answer to that question. There's always application. It's always something God wants us to change based on the truth of that passage. All right. That's what I was fishing for. Okay. So, yeah. Okay. So you, you clearly were able to bring solid application from the book of Daniel to your congregation in a way they mm-hmm. saw their need either most likely in the area of sanctification through this to change, right? I mean, this is, yes. it's there. So you know, I think I know you well enough. You just did not preach this as a professor would. You preached it as a pastor would. Yes. And, and I would also say that I, over the last 20 years, really year by year, uh, as every preacher would, uh, I'm, I'm getting better at this. Practice right. is helping. Uh, even even at our age, Marsh, yeah, <laughs> we we can still do better next time. And so, I, one of the reasons I'm eager to redo Daniel, I think the book is so important, so important prophetically. Yeah. But even just the message of each chapter, that I I have, uh, I take even more seriously now, the responsibility to be very specific mm-hmm. in application. And so that would be a point of improvement over 20 years ago. What was there any staying on the application? Was there any surprising uh, applications that came out that you, I mean, I know this was a while back. It may be too specific to ask you to pull that out with any um, surprising applications that, wow, I never thought about that before from this passage. Uh, well, there definitely would have been because I hadn't preached through the book before. Okay. And so you know, reading through it is different from preparing to preach it. Right. But once again, I'm going to have to plead uh, yeah. <laughs> a, a shortened Fair. memory there on what the experience really was like. Well, no, and I, I want to thank you in front of everybody for tackling the topic. Okay, because uh, in, in fact, a little I should have said this in the introduction. We talked about a couple of books. Um, your name surfaced, uh, and one of them was Daniel. We, you know, you need to talk to Pastor Remus to see if he's done it because I'm sure it's done well. And so you, you know, so I, I think I, I came to you with the topic versus you coming to me. So <laughs> it, it's not like I knew that you had just preached this. Okay, so I I appreciate you digging out uh, your notes and going back through this. So thank you for that. All right, well, so, I did have uh, some pre- personal preparation because uh, I I have taught the. the subject of eschatology on the seminary level for well, probably 15 years. Okay. And, and, and of course, this is an important part of that. You also gave me the option of the book of Revelation, and I right. talk that and preach through that, but, um, and that has its own challenges as and well. We, we, we may come to back to that. Else. Yeah, well, I don't know. <laughs> we may come back to you on that. All right. So uh, along this line here, so as now you were preaching this on Sunday night, so the, the Sunday night crowd uh, normally in our circles would not, I mean, we know they're always unsaved in the, in the congregation, but uh, normally on Sunday night, it's going to be the regular uh, churchgoers. But uh, how did you preach the gospel from this book? Was there an emphasis that emerged through these 12 messages that you found, mm-hmm. or what would you, how would you encourage a man? Again, our audience are those probably who are considering preaching it. So, Pastor Remers, well, how would you go there? Well, I, I think the, uh, the sovereignty of God as a theme that runs through every chapter, that is a powerful evangelistic yes. appeal. Okay. That here is a God that is going to have his way. He's going to have the final say, and and even as it relates directly to you, but that same sovereign God who is your judge, he is also offering his grace. You can have a relationship with him, and that runs throughout the whole book as well. So the, uh, the evangelistic appeal here, uh, there's no strain in the book of Daniel. It's right there. Amen. Well, thank you for that. Uh, let me also ask you this. So if you were, um, and, and I'm going two ways on this. So in just a minute, I want, I know I want you to dwell into Daniel one. We mentioned that earlier, uh, about, I know you taught this and I think our, our preachers and pastors could benefit from maybe some things you have from there if we haven't covered it. And then also if you would comment, if, if a man had limited resources 
to purchase commentaries or, or you know, he didn't have everything uh, available. Uh, mm-hmm. What which ones would you, uh, again, someone that's labored in the word, already done it, what would you recommend and maybe why? Okay. Well, let's uh, let's start with that second question about the commentaries. Okay, sure. and and I would say first, I I really would encourage men. Uh, it, it, this is the pattern I have adopted that you not open a commentary prematurely. Amen. Uh, for me, I I want to analyze the book. I want to see the message. I want to have a, and and I tell my students, I want to have a complete outline but not a final outline before I open a commentary. That is, I want to fill in all the gaps. And then a commentary is an opportunity to see what my good friends, the Mm -hmm. commentators, Mm -hmm. what they think about this. And then benefit from their help, incorporate those changes, refine what I've done. And so that it's an it's a important, I think, I think it's an essential part of the process. But I just caution against getting into it too soon. Uh, I don't want to feel like, well, all right, this is a message and I got it from this guy. Mm, yeah. uh, this needs to come directly from God to you. Amen. And then let these uh, uh, friends in print, uh, let them have their opportunity to influence what you've already thought. Yeah, well said. Well said. So uh, there in the book of Daniel, this is unusual. But for Daniel, uh, unusual in the, the wider scheme of scriptural genre, uh, there's one book that to me just rose to the top. Mm. And it, it's, I just consider it outstanding. Uh, his name is Leon Wood. Yeah. And it's unfortunately, it's out of print. Mm. But uh, in its, uh, here's my copy of it. Uh, it's out of print, but still available. And uh, I know it's still available because when I mentioned this, uh, when I assign Daniel 1 as a a sermon passage in my expository preaching class, uh, immediately students start looking online right there in class. uh, They say, I I, I just found a copy. It's so-and-so. And And so you can get it uh, in, in a used version. But Leon Wood is here here are his advantages he is thoroughly conservative really respects the word unfortunately that's not the case for many commentaries he's also very scholarly Uh, he interacts with uh, with the hebrew and then daniel uh, aramaic here's the real clincher for a prophetic book he's premillennial as well so many of the other commentators some of the old standards like uh, young, uh, they're, uh, they're amillennial and in a prophetic book, you just struggle, um, working with that. So to me, Leon Wood's got it all. He's thorough and he's, uh, exegetical and he ties in the historical aspect. So much of Daniel and his prophecy has already been fulfilled. Uh, the second, century, first century before Christ, and he has all that detail. Mm. It's just marvelous. Yeah. Uh, one of the things I look forward to when I redo a book that I had done in the past, and that is to find, well, what other commentaries are available now that weren't then? So I haven't made that search, but I have accumulated one, a few, uh, and one in particular, uh, this is written by uh, Peter, uh, Pete Stevenson, Peter Stevenson. Yeah, yeah. And it's, uh, by Bob Jones University Press, BJU Press. And uh, Pete Stevens, uh, Stevenson has written a number of commentaries, uh, on the Old Testament. And he is quite good. He's very mm. thorough, very reliable. Good. Yeah. Uh, and I, so I haven't, uh, utilize this. Right. Uh, he, this. This was uh, published five years after I preached in Daniel, but I look forward to utilizing that. Good. Uh, Good. All right, that's very helpful, and I appreciate that. Now, can we segue into Daniel 1? Can I pick your brain on sure. that a few yeah. minutes? Yes. Take- yeah, let's do that. I think Daniel 1 is an excellent, um, uh, well, it works as an excellent passage for me to assign. Uh, they only... <laughs> 
preach. Uh, they only uh, prepare a few sermons in that uh, two-hour course, but Daniel 1 is an excellent exercise, both for its prophetic value mm. and also its historical narrative uh, genre. So uh, Daniel 1, one of the challenges with any passage, of course, is, well, where are the main point divisions? Mm -hmm. One of the advantages in Daniel 1 is that the text itself helps to determine that. And, and that is, it's, it's in a recurring phrase that the phrase itself emphasizes the sovereignty of God. Hmm. Uh, it's, uh, the first one shows up in verse 2 where it says, the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar. God gave. It's not that the people of Israel failed in their uh, military strength. They did, but that's not why. It, it's because God sovereignly gave them sure. into his hand. God was not overwhelmed. God was in control. Uh, that paragraph goes through verse 7. The next one begins in verse 8, where, the, again, the second verse in that paragraph says that God gave Daniel favor. Hmm. Here's God intervening, but it's not in a way that anybody could see. There's no lightning. It's just this man's showing favor to Daniel. How'd that happen? There's a sovereign God at work. Good. And then you get down to verse 17. That begins the last paragraph yeah. where it says that God gave Daniel and his three friends learning and skill and wisdom. And Daniel had understanding and dream. God's giving a sovereign God providing what they need. So here's how I phrased those, uh, those main points again to with, with a, a universal um, a wording that, uh, that immediately applies today. Uh, the first seven verses, God is sovereign over your circumstances. Hmm. And just imagine how encouraging that would have been for Daniel, who finds himself as a teenager in Babylon uh, under the uh, scrutiny and uh, supervision of the pagan king. Right. But it's God who's in control. He controls your circumstances. That's true sure. for us today. In verses 8 through 16, the sovereign uh, God is sovereign over your authorities. He gave him favor. And then 17 to 21, God is sovereign over your opportunities. The doors God opened, the abilities he provides, that uh, he can give his people today what they Amen. need to serve. Amen. What they need to succeed, and uh, there it is. The outline's built right in to the passage itself. That's great, and I know our listeners are are benefiting from that. Uh, so thank you for your your helpful outline there of Daniel one. And I think as we, you know, and, and you teach expository preaching, there's nothing like reading and meditating and reading and highlighting, and reading and marking, and reading and pointing arrows, and reading and diagramming, and read, you know, just to come up with the way the word is laid out. So, again, mm -hmm. thank you. Thank you for those pointers. Okay, anything else you want to say on that? Any other tips on expository preaching from the book of Daniel before we uh, wrap it up with a couple more questions? Well, yes, I, I – I did pull out the outline that I used back then. So this is not uh, revised and uh, enhanced. This is just what it was 20 years ago. But the format is basically the same as what I use now. And I, I find my students uh, uh, wonder, uh, what, does it take some special ability to use this format? And I assure them all it takes is the grace of God, and anybody can do this. But here's what I take with me into the pulpit, and okay. this is always the case. It's a single sheet of paper, seven and a half by five and a half. It fits in right. a little three-ring binder. All my sermons right. in the past are in those binders. And uh, anything I can't fit onto that sheet of paper, 
uh, doesn't come with me in the pulpit. All right, for those and that the are, reason for the yeah. reason for that size is it fits right in my Bible, Bible. Yeah. because I don't want it to be apparent that I have anything in front of me at all. Not that I'm trying to be deceptive, right. but I don't want to be tied to anything but the text of Scripture, and I want to be free to interact with my people visually, looking at them in the eye. Uh, and all I have to do is glance down at this outline. Uh, that's how I have, uh, how I've done it and how I encourage my students, because I think it frees me up. I don't have too much here that I'm distracted and looking down a lot. I'm looking up at them. All right. So in your style of preaching that, that God uses you in, you don't manuscript. I do not. Okay. And I, so, I find if I manuscript, then I want to read it. Yeah, yeah, and I, and I think that is, I appreciate what you said, looking up, communicating the word directly. And we know God yes. wires us all differently, and there have been some men God greatly used that, does, that do manuscript. Yes. And, and, but I appreciate you doing the way you feel like you're communicating the word most effectively. And for those who are listening and not on YouTube, so what he held up was simply a, a really a, a seven and a half by five and a half sheet of paper that had all his notes for like Daniel one, when he preached Daniel mm-hmm. one. So all his notes in the point he was saying there is he's not taking volumes of notes into the pulpit. He's taking his keynotes and, and preaching and looking up. Uh, so mm-hmm. thank you for that. So that, that's yes, our, our eyes are our most uh, powerful, uh, form yeah. of gesture. You gesture with your eyes, how you look at people. It's an interaction point yeah. that uh, I really have, uh, I, I, I've been convinced it's essential. Yeah. And, and this is a totally, I'm getting off on a hobby horse here, but I do want to, for our listeners and viewers that may have gotten comfortable staying at home and tuning in online, that's a key reason to be in the congregation because mm-hmm. you're not going to pick up those facial, you're not going to pick up the same communication that your pastor is laboring to have with you as he's communicating the truth on video as you was, you do sitting in the, in the audience. So I just want to, again, emphasize the importance of being there in person, uh, in the local church, as you hear your pastor bring the word of God. So I appreciate you bringing that, that point out about communication because it is so important. All right. So, um, a couple last questions if, and then you can, I didn't want to cut you. Did I cut you off on anything there? No. Okay. No. So, did you uh, mean to? pardon me. Did you mean to? No, 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 I didn't. I, I just <laughs> speaking of manuscripting, I was looking at my next question. Uh, so I, I guess we, we, you mentioned preaching this again, and you've already mentioned a, a new commentary or two you would go to. Uh, so mm-hmm. if, if you did it all over again and you've already covered it, so may not need to go back there again. Um, what would you do differently? And, and you said you may or may not do chapter by chapter. I don't want to put words in your mouth. That's what you did 20 years ago, 12 chapters, mm-hmm. 12 messages. So would you, you would, you would reexamine that you said. I would reexamine it and yeah. I'm open to like, could Daniel one be three messages instead mm. of one? Well, mm. it could. Right. Uh, would we benefit enough from taking it one paragraph at a time? Would that counter the uh, uh, sufficiently the benefit of seeing the whole picture of that chapter? I would rethink that. Right. And I'll tell you, I, I would especially feel pressure to do that in chapter 11. Chapter mm. 11 is 45 verses. Wow. Uh, that's enormous. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, at the same time, if I've gotten to chapter 11 and I've done one chapter each week yeah. at that point, if you yeah, see the yeah. pressure of, I, I do. better stay with the pattern. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, yeah. I don't know. And, and we'll I see. think so on the positive side, and, and you can comment or not comment on this. I think we as pastors, we do set a certain expectation. In other words, if we started preaching through the book of Daniel and we're on this K, we're on this pace it almost could become a, a huge distraction it is, it, you know, if we get off of it. So I, I'm just, that was totally a, we may need to edit that all the way out. I don't know. But anyway, I'm just saying. Uh, well, I, I would say that that is worth considering. 
Yeah. That if you're if you've gone like three, four, or five chapters in, and you've done it one particular way, and you're getting some feedback from your people, like maybe they're going to indicate to me, could we slow this down? Mm. I think it's it's good. It's best yeah. to be responsive to okay. uh, to what your people are sensing. And, yeah. and so that changes in midstream. Uh, I think that's definitely worth considering. Yeah. All right. So, and you may not know this yet, but if you were to preach it again, would you do it again on a Sunday night? Would you shift it to Sunday morning or would you do it Wednesday night? I think I would do it Sunday morning this okay. time. Okay. All I, right. I think the message is that important uh, that I would like to, you know, we have unsaved guests week after week. Uh, and I, I would like to expose them to this as well. Amen. Okay. Last question, Pastor Gary Reimers, Cornerstone Baptist Church, preparing to preach the book of Daniel. So how did this book, your study, your labor, hours of laboring, uh, how did it change Pastor Gary Reimers as a believer, as a husband, as a father, as a grandfather, as a pastor? Well, as uh, as a child of God and having to interact with the real world circumstances, real life problems day after day, like everybody else, uh, pastors are not excluded, uh, that the, the, the consistent week after week reminder that there is a sovereign God Amen. in control. Why did that have to happen? It's a, it's God's sovereign plan. There is just such genuine comfort in the midst of hardship and surprise and uh, for all variety of circumstances and the implicit call that you can trust this God. He's sovereign. And yes, that includes problems in your life that he wants you to experience, but it also includes the grace to endure it. Amen. And, and that the end result is going to be, we're going to make it Amen. because that's how, that's the promise of God's grace. You can get through this. You know, brothers, you say that, um, I know some pastors that are struggling right now. And as you mm. went through that, I said, you know, I have not referenced them or given advice. Hey, go study the book of Daniel. But after your comments mm. and focusing on the sovereignty and the God's grace, I, I think I just got a new tool to help encourage pastors. So mm -hmm. I, I thank I you for God that. Can use it. Yeah, thank you for that word. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, Pastor, any closing thoughts? Any Anything we may have left out here you want to put in? I would strongly urge every pastor, uh, you do not need to avoid the book of Daniel. Amen. Uh, there is rich fruit uh, to reap and to feed Amen. your people there. Amen. All right. Thank you so much for helping us today. We appreciate your ministry. Thank you, Pastor Gary Reimers, Cornerstone Baptist Church, Greenville, South Carolina. Thanks, brother. Thank you, Marsh. Yep. You're listening to ReChurch, a podcast of Gospel Fellowship Association Missions. If you would like more information about our ministry or how we may assist you and your church, visit us at gfamissions.org slash consulting.